Welcome to Healthy Planet, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. I'm your host, Dr. Grace O'Neill. Joining me today is Lillian Kumick, vegan chef. Welcome, Lillian. Thank you for being on the show again. So tell My us pleasure. about your new products. I know um, you have some well, chocolate, you have other projects you're working on. Mm-hmm. Uh, the biggest project I'm working on at the moment is my third book uh, titled Hawaii Washoku. It's going to be released at the end of the year, hopefully around November, so just in time for the holidays. And it's a gluten-free and vegan plant-based cookbook about Japanese cuisine. But the title, Hawaii Washoku, is um, a very unique concept where I'm connecting the principles of washoku, Japanese cuisine, with the spirit of aloha. So it's going to be a very unique read, um, about 150 recipes. <laughs> so very much looking forward to, to its release. Nice. So all the recipes are Japanese recipes? Mm -hmm. Yes, all Japanese, all Japanese recipes. Um, for people that don't know me, I'm from Australia, from Sydney originally but i i did live in japan for 30 years so three decades of my life and that's where i became a chef that's where i started my cooking career so this book has been um in the works for a long time it was just a matter of when and how i i do it so this is this is a very very exciting um project for me and i can't wait to share it with everyone Indeed. Um, so you are you able to give us a preview maybe of the, I don't know if you can give us a preview, but maybe um, just some names of some things that might be in the cookbook or I don't know if you're done or what your mm -hmm. situation is. Yes. So we're actually, we've moved into the editing stage now and that that's a few months work there when we get the layout and design done. But the, the book itself is, um, there's 11 chapters in the book, um, ranging from one of one of the main chapters, I would have to say, is the planted sushi and planted sashimi um, chapters. In the book, I actually do not use the word vegan or plant-based, plant rarely. So I've um, swapped that word for planted, and that's mm -hmm. going to show up in the um, on the cover of the book as well. But it's just, it's a, it's a great way that I think it is, um, works for a lot of people it's not as intimidating as some words that kind of scare people and and maybe you know this will be more comfortable for them so very exciting chapters the planted sushi and sashimi chapters very interesting and i've you know keeping in mind this is a cookbook so food that is doable in your own kitchen in your non-japanese kitchen so all of the recipes are easy simple to follow there is a photograph for every single recipe and uh, some some side pictures as well with step-to-step -step, um, guides on how to get through the recipe. So very, um, very interesting book. And the pictures are beautiful. I also am the photographer of all of my three books, <laughs> including this one. So that's that's almost like writing a whole book itself when you do the photography as well. So, yeah, I hope everyone enjoys enjoys what I've put together. It's it's gonna be a really great book. Oh, I'm sure it'll be enjoyed by many people. I'm wondering, um, do you show us how to make tofu or is that something that's in the book? Not tofu from scratch, no. And there there are there are some some recipes like homemade miso, um, homemade what else is there? I put homemade miso, um a lot of the sources definitely homemade, but uh, the reason I didn't do a homemade tofu from the soybean is because I want to keep it um, realistic. And in Japan, basically, people don't make their own tofu. Very, very rarely do people make their own miso. But once a year, it it ha it is a thing. It it can be a once a year sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah, in order to to get as many fit in as many recipes as I think um the book deserves i haven't i haven't gone overboard mm -hmm. with stuff like that and quite frankly um personally 
I've never made a homemade tofu that I have felt is worthy of <laughs> putting in a recipe book. It's a, it's a very tricky sort of mm-hmm. process. So It's harder than cheese then, I guess. It's harder than vegan cheese. It is. But there's um, I'm doing a lot. There's actually a chapter, a whole chapter on tofu dishes, and some of the exciting things in that chapter um, use an ingredient called shio koji or salt koji. Um, this is a very, very popular ingredient amongst foodies. And I have done also a homemade version of that. So the recipe is made from scratch. Um, if you think miso and soy sauce, things like that are game changers in cooking, wait till you try shio koji. And if you haven't, you can get it from any of the Japanese stores here on the island. It's like a, it's a marinade or um, a seasoning, a condiment, I guess. You can use it just like that. That, that is a game changer when it comes to Japanese food, adds incredible umami to everything. And shio koji actually also works as a tenderizer. So just simply by marinating anything like vegetables, I have a broccoli and a Brussels sprout um, oven baked dish that is tenderized in this shio koji marinade. Amazing. So amazing! You have to yeah. Show us how to make the shio koji, though, so we can. I do. We don't feel like going out to buy it, or maybe we'll just go out to buy it to see what it tastes like. So when we make our own, see if we can replicate the taste or make it better. <laughs> yes, it's actually it's actually exactly like you know soy sauce or shoyu or miso. One of those things that a lot of people don't make, but it's it's so simple. I had to actually put the recipe in the book. It's like a five minute process. But if you're actually going to go out and buy the the koji, um, then you might as well just buy the shio koji ready made and try it first to see if you like it. So in the tofu section, I actually make cheeses, aged cheese cheese from tofu that has been marinated in shio koji. Um, I don't have a picture of that for you, but it's incredible. It it completely changes the texture of tofu. It, you would you would have no idea. It oh, wow. it started off as a block of tofu. So there's some really um there's some really cutting edge sort of exciting recipes in the book that I think are going to be very interesting for a lot of um people who enjoy cooking and who are interested in, you know, delving into some more plant based plant based cuisine. So Mm-hmm. Now I hear that the Japanese they're obsessed with strawberries. So I don't know if you have any recipes with strawberries, but I hear that you know though the Japanese climate is not really tropical, they have these uh, little greenhouses that keep the strawberries warm because you know they like to grow in hot weather only, um, even in the winter, and it takes up a ton of energy. I can't remember where I heard that, but I heard it on, on the radio. I thought it was really interesting. So, you know, they have the strawberry mochi. I don't know if you have any recipes for the strawberry mochi, but um, the one in the farmer's market is really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like that, and, and that would be awesome. yeah, <laughs> and it's also um, vegan and gluten free, I believe, the one at the farmer's market. I do have a recipe for the strawberry mochi. Um, I have a recipe for the mochi itself, for the encore, mm-hmm. the bean mixture. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then it's basically wrapped in a strawberry. In the book, I do have a picture that I would like to share with um, the viewers, and that is of the fruit sando, fruits sando, the fruit sandwich. (laughs) These things are, you know, they're they're, they're so popular in Japan. Fruit sandwiches are definitely a thing and they're amazing, but they're always made with Japanese milk bread, um, which obviously is not, you know, plant-based friendly so you have to substitute um the bread that you like but fruit sandwiches very popular um instead of the cream i'm using a vegan cream cheese that has just been uh, sweetened a little bit with sugar so that's another interesting recipe and and you're absolutely right japanese go crazy for strawberries and for good reason because i'll tell you now in my humble opinion (laughs) they have the best strawberries on the planet and beyond beyond (laughs) 
if you've never tried a Japanese strawberry, buy an airplane ticket, get on the plane and go there just for the strawberries. <laughs> So what other kinds of desserts do you have in your book? I'm very interested in Japanese desserts. Mm -hmm. I am keeping it very, very Japanese, um, the whole book, actually. So I'm not doing much of flavoured cookies or this and that. Um, there is one cheesecake recipe, the matcha cheesecake recipe. And the reason I'm doing that is because you might know, but or maybe you don't, but in Japan, cheesecake is very, very, very popular, mm -hmm. extremely popular. They have um, baked versions, raw versions, um, cotton cheesecake versions. So I definitely had to do my version of uh, the cheesecake. It's a cashew base. And then the rest are just all mochi. There's mochi I recipes. Mochi. <laughs> oh, I do as well. And I don't think many people know how easy mochi is to make because recently um, I actually got some omiyage from a friend who bought mochi from one of the Japanese confectionery stores here. It's very expensive to buy. I was actually quite surprised. Very good though. But yeah, I, I hope this book encourages you to just to, to sort of start making more Japanese food it's not as difficult as you think you know most people look at Japanese food and how beautiful it, it it is it's you know a work of art in in many cases but very cheapable for for the regular home cook very you can you can you can whip up all of these things so the dessert section yeah, it, it's going to be really, really cool. And I think eye-opening at how easy some of these recipes are to, to nail. Yeah, I would love to learn how to make mochi because I'm always buying it at Peace Cafe. You know, those little ones that are wrapped in the saran wrap. And okay. It would be, yeah, I would love to make something like that because it's not too heavy. I find that some of the American mm. desserts, when you buy a cake here, they're really heavy. They're super sweet. And yes. the ones that you buy in Asia are not as sweet. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like that a little bit better. I prefer that. Mm -hmm. I do um, want to go, go ahead. Yeah. No, Grace, I was going to tell you about um, just another one of the, the desserts in the in the sweet things uh, chapter is nama choco. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of that? Nama no, choco is, um, it, it translates to like raw chocolate in Japan. It's it's kind of everywhere. But I have a matcha um chocolate and then a dark chocolate with Japanese hibiki whiskey in it. Very decadent. Um yeah, very addictive. <laughs> That's great. I'll definitely be checking that out. <laughs> I want I wanna go through your pictures because you sent me some really lovely pictures if you could tell us, you know, I know we went through the sandwich, but um can you show some of the other ones, Michael? This is uh this was taken in Kyoto in Japan. So I mentioned earlier I, I did live in Japan for 30 years. And this is just a picture that I'm adding, adding some of my um experiences and moments that I had in Japan throughout the book. So beautiful Kyoto. Uh if you've never been to Japan, put this on your bucket list. Put Japan in general on your bucket list. It's such a special country. This is uh, the Sendai, uh, Sendai, the city that I lived in. Um, Sendai is known for its beautiful trees and nature. It's actually nicknamed the City of Trees. And this is the main street. I actually lived off this main street, um, Jōzenji Dori. Anyway, th this is just a monument or a statue that I walked past probably almost every day. And uh, it has a lot of, I have a lot of memories when I look at this. So Sendai is the place that I lived in the Tohoku region. That's where um, the 2013 earthquake and tsunami occurred. Uh, but it's, it's a beautiful place, beautiful food, and highly recommend if you ever visit Japan, visit the Tohoku region. Mm, this is my Obento picture picture of lunch boxes in japan lunch there's a there's a meaning behind a lot of lunch boxes if you look at the bottom picture sort of in the middle 
that's <laughs> that's like a love a love bento. Mm -hmm. um, lots of women or mothers or wives make make these bento with characters and heart shaped vegetables or heart shaped nori or some stuff like that. Um, they spend a lot of time making bentos. Bentos are another work of art in Japan. They don't mess around, you know, making these things. They're, they're very almost competitive, I would say, especially if you look at some of the bento that bento boxes that parents are, you know, making for their kids. They're incredible. But yeah, lunch boxes, all, all of them have a meaning. And in every in every thing, everything that Japanese people do, there's a principle called the rule of five or the principles of washoku. There's five of them. And what that's what makes Japanese cuisine so special is they have all these principles like um, that suggest you have you should have five colors in every meal, five different textures, five different cooking methods. So if you go back to the picture that Michael just showed now, this is a typical meal. And it's called Ichiju Sansai, one soup, three dishes. This is this is basically um, a, a very common concept in, in the Japanese cuisine. You have a bowl of rice, three sides, and a soup. And then the extra dish would be skemon or pickles, some sort of Japanese pickles. So the, the dish that I have there for the main dish, the main protein, that's... Uh, tofu but it kind of looks like a, a piece of fried fish the egg roll is also made from tofu and some nori so everything everything japanese people do they they it's it's a very mindful cuisine they think about color texture um they reflect their they're very very um heavy on gratitude so before every single meal a Japanese person will put their hands together and say itadakimasu. They will do that whether they are alone with a stranger, eating in a restaurant alone, they will do this. They'll go itadakimasu before the meal, which just means um, I'm going to eat. But basically it's showing gratitude for the person that made the food. At the end of the meal, they'll say gochisou sama deshita, the same sort of, you know, showing the same sort of gratitude. So in the book, um, I do try to, as I mentioned earlier, sort of bring these two spiritual um, just principles between the spirit of aloha and the principles of the Japanese cuisine called washoku. So it's a, it's a, it's interesting. You'll get it once you once you read it. You'll um, start to think, wow, okay, that's why so many Japanese people come to Hawaii and they just love they love the the spiritual vibe here. So the picture that I am showing, that Michael's showing now, this is um, part of uh, Shojin Ryori, which is the Buddhist vegetarian cuisine in Japan that was that started with um, Buddhist monks. This was actually the sort of food they ate because they abstained from eating animals um, way back in the day. And even to this day, shoujin yori, you can find this in temples and some restaurants in Japan serve it. It's very, um, very, very healthy, mainly vegan, uh, mainly mainly plant based. And those, those the dish that you just saw now was a steamed savory custard, very popular um, dish in Japan. It's just Japanese food is so healthy, and there's a story behind yeah. all of all of the, the dishes so once you start reading more about Japanese food if you enjoy eating Japanese food just go online and, and google it and and find out why it is as it is it's very very interesting and this is my main photo for the book this is what we call washoku um, Japanese cuisine it's also kaiseki ryori kai, like a kaiseki course which is basically a high-end um, japanese cuisine a high-end course kaiseki courses can be anywhere from 8 to 15 or 16 dishes per course so that is a typical what you will find if you go to a 
um, restaurant or if you stay in a hot spring or something and you order a kaiseki course, that's what it looks like. It's incredible. And all of the dishes in that photo are in the book. We have a few minutes left, so I do want to touch on your new uh, column in Crave, Secret Garden. Can you tell us about that? Yes. So this year I was asked to become a, a columnist for the Star Advertiser's Crave magazine. My column comes out the third Wednesday of um, every month, and it's called Secret Garden. So basically I introduce or I, I review plant-based options on the islands, in particular on Oahu. So I, I um, introduce restaurants. I do recipes every now and again. So you can see, you can, you'll, if you subscribe to the Star Advertiser, you'll, you'll get the Crave magazine every Wednesday. Mine's the third Wednesday of every month. You can also go to my webpage, lillianvegan.com. And in the blog section, I do, I do an extensive sort of um, follow up from that column. So lots of pictures. If you're ever looking for plant based options, that's a good place to start at my webpage. So I keep everyone up to date with what's um, what's going on on the islands. There's there's so many op vegan options on the islands. I'm only touching the surface. So this is really fun to do once a month. Is there anything new that maybe some people haven't been to yet or seen? Um, I, I don't believe so, but I, I could, I could be wrong. I'm I, I don't want to say no to that answer because I'm not sure. Um, there are pop-ups sort of happening all over the island, so it's it yeah, it's hard to stay on track with what what exactly is going on. But what I can tell you is there there are more more plant-based options than one thinks. And what I'm trying to do is unravel the plant-based options that are not necessarily only in vegan restaurants plant-based options that exist in in restaurants in general because that's an you know that's an important important place to start because plant-based food as we know is not only meant for plant-based people people who are on a plant-based diet anyone can enjoy healthy plant-based food so i hope that people do start you know to to challenge or uh, start to experience some of the options that are in restaurants give it a try you know next time you're at a restaurant skip the ditch the burger and go for a plant-based one just to see what it what it tastes like so you know you do that once a week and slowly you can reduce the amount of meat that you are you know consuming and it, it will be good for the planet and your health in general and your mind body and soul absolutely uh, so tell us about some of the, um, maybe some of the places that are more known for their meat, the establishments that are more known for their meat, but they do have surprisingly some plant-based options that are really good. Is there mm. any place on the island that you would think of? Yes. So um, actually in downtown, there are two restaurants I highly recommend. One is Rangoon Burmese Restaurant. Um, they have a lot of plant-based options and the food is just amazing. So Rangoon, um, also in the Chinatown area, there's uh, Olay's Thai Laos cuisine. Amazing. Um, Thai Laotian, pardon me. They also can pretty much veganize anything on the menu. And they are also, they're very, very, um, the staff are very, uh knowledgeable about what's on the menu so if you have allergies or gluten-free or you're you know allergic to peanuts they can they can adopt any any dish to your dietary you know needs or preferences and there, there's a lot i mean one of my favorite restaurants is in waikiki and that would be uh island vintage wine bar the chef is a korean yes a korean um chef there I actually gave them, I awarded them the Alima Award for 2022 for the best plant-based options in Hawaii. Yeah, so that's a, that's an awesome place, it's just amazing food. And again, these places are not are not vegan restaurants, but they're 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 trying very very hard to accommodate, which is you know something I'm very grateful for that they're 
they're keeping keeping their options on the menu so that everyone can go there and and dine there and enjoy it. So I'm curious at Island Vintage Wine Bar, what mm -hmm. uh, vegan options do they have that you found so fabulous? Um, they are actually they're priced very very reasonable for what you get. So because of the chef's Korean background, she does a lot of sort of Asian slash Hawaiian dishes. Um, for example, there might be like a a Korean dish there that I love that has a little bit of kimchi, some, uh, you know, Okinawa purple sweet potato, baked sweet potato. Then it might have some sea asparagus. It's just very, very unique dishes that, and the portions are all family sized, but they're, they're between, you know, 15 and $25. You order one dish, you'll never finish it. Although I can, because I, 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 I'm a good eater, especially when the food is good. <laughs> that's that's one of the myths, isn't it, Grace? That um, you know, vegans don't eat much. It's completely false. We I eat a lot of more. good food. Yeah. I would say we eat more. Yeah, I would say and we eat in more. yes, yeah. and in general, we eat a lot of different types of food. Probably more than the average person because we do, yeah, you know, nuts, food. legumes. We go all around the, yeah, yeah all around the. Um, land in search of what we can eat so island vintage wine bar is, is my number one restaurant here on the island I, I would say highly recommend i'll have to check it out i mean because i'm always looking for places with my parents you know and my parents mm -hmm. are super picky and then of course i often don't have anywhere to go with them because they like to eat meat so i'm always looking for something that will accommodate me but is not completely plant-based so mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's yeah there's many places like that you just you just have to look and honestly just go into any restaurant that you normally go to whether you're vegan or not and just ask them ask the staff what they can do in terms of plant-based you'll be surprised um people are, i think are, are more open to the idea of accommodating you know customers different you know, dietary preferences. So I do it just because I want to make it clear that <laughs> that there are customers like myself um, who who want to eat at their establishment, but you know, if there are if there are reasonable options, I don't want to go to a restaurant and eat a um, a wimpy lettuce salad. Yeah, no, know, and, and pay fifteen dollars for it. It's yeah. just not on. So if you're going to, um, you know, thinking outside of the box, that's why I commend, I commend the chefs and you know the the people behind the restaurants that are that are adding a lot of plant based options onto their menus. I think it's it's wonderful and and it's something that we really need, especially here in Hawaii, because Grace, you would um, know more about it than me. But there's you know a lot of obesity, uh, high diabetes rates here, so clearly we could all clean up our, our diets. And I think the one thing that concerns me is that all of that, all of that sort of worrying goes out the door when you go into a restaurant, you walk into a restaurant and suddenly sugar, salt, oil, all those bad things are, are okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be like that. Dining out doesn't have to mean, you know, that it has to be, you know, you know, on the junk food side, it can't that healthy, healthy dining out is a thing. And I think Hawaii is a good place where, you know, this could be promoted even more. Absolutely. Um, so we're out of time, believe it or not, but we have to wrap it up. Um, I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. This is Healthy Planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. We've been talking with Lillian Kumick about her new cookbook and her other projects. Uh, thanks to Michael, our broadcast engineer, and the rest of the Korea Think Tech for hosting our show. And thanks to your listeners for listening. I'll see you in two weeks for more of Healthy Planet on Think Tech, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet. My next guest will be from the Hawaii Wildlife Center. If you have ideas for the show or questions for my future guests, please contact me at healthyplanetthinktech at gmail.com. Check out my website at graceinhawaii.com. 
or Instagram at Graceful Living 365 for more information on my projects, including future show guests. I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech.